But I kept seeing this so much in my own volunteer work that I thought, no one is writing about these women <laughs> who are in the church and in the League of Women Voters and in the you know, party caucus and doing all this political work who are um, upper middle class survivors of spouse abuse. And so that's where Goldie came from initially. But I noticed this, that these, these people would just treat their children so terribly before a catered event, just awful. And the caterer was always uh, reluctant or afraid to confront this very wealthy person because of what would happen to the caterer. Mm -hmm. um, but so then I, what I do is I write to my characters to find out what happened. So I wrote a letter to Goldie. What happened when you turned these people in? And then she wrote me back a letter. And that was the takeoff point for Sticks and Scones, is that these people whom Goldie had called 911 on are now out to get her. You know, that is so interesting. There are several very good books out at the moment. I'm trying to remember her name, Julia Hamilton and Laura Wilson, both mm -hmm. British authors, mm -hmm. who have written books in which upper class child neglect plays a large role. You know, children who are left to servants and whatever to, to raise mm -hmm. because their parents are leading, you know, um, an enormous, sure. wealthy, you know, rotating houses, et cetera. And because um, the children are living not only was servants looking after them, but the size of the establishment, the size of the house is so tremendous that no one can really keep up with what they're doing. So there are enormous opportunities for children to engage in peccadillos that sure. in a smaller household, you know, a typically middle class house, right. nobody could fail to spot. I'm not surprised. And I, I, yeah. I hadn't really thought about it in connection with what, uh, with what you're just saying there, but it certainly it could be as easily a feature well, and in it our is, society. Right, yeah. and see what you have right before a catered party is this very high tension. And very wealthy people want everything to look perfect and so on and so forth. So they're micromanaging the caterer, which drives the caterer crazy. And so the children are clamoring for attention, they sense the stress and so on and so forth, and that's when all hell breaks loose. And um, I tell you, all you, all you have to do is see that a couple times when you realize, as a writer, this is something I need to write about. So. What are, are most of those events, um, catered events, done for an extension of a business purpose, essentially? Or, it or is it a social a society building block? What, what, well, what but are it's the both. motives? But it's both, because a lot of times what you'll have in our, in, in our mountain community is that someone who has come in and is establishing themselves, say as a financial advisor, um, will have brought in a lot of money, uh, bought a big place, or maybe even leveraged it out and then will throw a huge party in order to establish themselves in the community as someone who is trustworthy, um, who has a lot of money, who knows what to do with money and so on. And then, and then that's how it starts. Even a wedding reception can sometimes become sort of a business event, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so it, they're always looking for that. And then I have done straight business events um, with, with the caterer that I work with where they'll have all the vice presidents of a particular company, 32 of them, all male, uh, to come out and do the paint pellet game. <laughs> the who? The, uh, the paint pellet game, you know, where they go around no, and wear, I know. Oh, they wear camouflage clothing and they go out and shoot each other and so on and so forth. So if you're the caterer, you've never heard of this? No. Oh, yes. They, so they, they shoot each other with these paint pellets. And so then they have to hide from each other. And um, it's a very macho type game. And so the caterer makes these fancy box lunches. And then when all the guys come trooping in with their camo clothing on, we give them Stolichnaya vodka right out of the freezer and, you know, shrimp and, uh, you know, fancy things like that. And then have the fancy dinner. Is so this all sort of a team building exercise? Uh, that's the theory, you know, along with all the fancy food and wine and booze and so on and so forth. Yeah. You but, know, yeah no uh, women. <laughs> that's what interested me. That's absolutely fascinating, but you know what that is? That's very much like a shoot in English terms. I'm actually yes, more right. familiar because of right. my lifelong that's reading in British mystery, but the, that sounds exactly, you know, like right. the guys going out with that's the guns right. after the pheasant and right. um, the lunches are brought out in caravans that's and the right. whole nine yards. That's, so right. that's kind of our American version. That huh? is our American version, Colorado version anyway. <laughs> It's truly fascinating. I hadn't thought about catering mm. as a window on the rich, but I guess it really would be because who oh, else can afford them? Oh, but it is. It is a window on the sure. rich. Sure. Absolutely. So, and that's what I found working with Sticks and Scones is that people talking with caterer for the National Trust, you know, in England where they manage all the large homes and castles and so on. I asked who um, requisitions these meals that are Elizabethan style feasts, and they said, well, when Americans want these meals. What they want is the recreation of a feast from 
the movie of Taming of the Shrew, <laughs> okay, <laughs> or, or, or something from Brideshead Revisited or so on. In other words, not echt Elizabethan fare, which really no one can eat because it's eels and sugar, basically, and fish and sugar and beef and sugar, you know, and, um, smoked trout and sugar. And, uh, but what Americans want is a feast such as was shown in a certain movie. And uh, so it's a, a lo lo big part of catering is the spectacle. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There are terrific opportunities. Rob and I went, my husband and I, were taken to a banquet at Hatfield House. Okay. And, you know, it's wonderful how they parade um, the food in and how they dress. Um, is it the peacock when the peacock. they roast it? That's right. The peacock is a perfect example. Now, this would send any um, food inspection person in this country just absolutely into a total paroxysm of pain. But yeah. what they would do with the peacock, because I, I went to Hampton Court and spent the entire day in the Tudor kitchens to research sticks and scones. They would skin the pe peacock. Right. Okay, and then remove skin, feathers, and everything. Oh, then they didn't pluck it first. They, no, they no, did no. it all as a package. That's right, that's okay. right. Skin and feathers and everything they set aside. And the head with the beak and so on and so forth. Then they would roast the peacock. Okay, then they bring it back and put the skin and feathers back on with, and then put the head back on with the beak gilded. And as you're saying, the, the procession was very important. And so they would, this was, what would lead the procession was the roast peacock with the gilded beak from the kitchens at Hampton Court um, all the way up to the Great Hall to present to Henry VIII. And sent the boar similarly. They, they would boar, actually keep right. the head um, and while they might boil out the brain, don't they make head yeah. cheese or the, something? That's right, that's right. Which is always handed to me absolutely disgusting. Awful. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, a lifelike boar with the right. apple and the whole bit and then right. the platter. That's right. And, um, the, and the marzipan. See, the marzipan was a whole separate section. Right. And because it was so hot in the kitchens that the marzipan would melt if they right. had it there. So they would have this whole long hall separating where the desserts were made from the, you know, making the fish and meat and so on and so forth. Okay. They had a marzipan cake, which they presented again to Henry VIII there with actual cannon on it. Okay, small cannon, miniaturized, which then would give off actual gunpowder, would, you know, shoot gunpowder out and burn down one whole section of Hampton Court. No. <laughs> no, these, these huge marzipan creations were a part of the procession for the dessert. Well, sure, and of course, access to sugar and the things that make marzipan was something only the truly rich That's right. uh, could afford. Same That's thing right. with the spices. That's exactly right. And of course, the famous four and twenty blackbird idea. Oh, that's right. They would do those incredible pastries. That's and, right. You know, it was uh, a spec. I guess it's similar to you know letting doves go at like after a sports event or something mm -hmm. of the sort. Mm -hmm. They would actually at the last minute put live birds under the that's pastry, right. right? And then they could so open it up. That's exactly right. Or they would actually put jewels into it, which I used in six and scones. Right. But the four and twenty blackbirds was absolutely something that they did, and it was just part of the entertainment that was the food. Well, and there wasn't. I mean, they did have uh, court musicians, and, and you know, right. there'd be the gallery, and, and, and right. they would have dance, and they would even have mass, literally with mass, and, and, mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. But indeed, the food and the processional. I, the other thing, too, I don't know that we realize, unless you go see it, is the hierarchy that was observed. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, that old bit about above and below the salt, which was literally true with the That's giant right. salt cellar, and if you That's were above right. it, you were classier good than stuff. Right. below it. Uh, but the king would be on the dais or, or, right. or the noble lord or whatever mm -hmm. it was and people ranked around and say so the processional in part was to take the best food up to, right. you know, number one. That's right. And, um, and then the, it would sort of pass on down mm -hmm. um, to... The lower echelons. Right. Exactly. And hideously unsanitary. I've always thought, you know, that whole bit about, you know, oh, over know. the shoulder into the rushes and the general, I mean, just think of the rats and the, you know, oh. the insects and oh. the general ghastliness of well, it. Well, there again, any modern day health inspector would just be, you know. Flip out. Right. But this is why they had to move from castle to castle, which is what I learned when I was over there, is that, see, because the dogs ran loose too. Absolutely. So you have all kinds of things you don't even want to think about in the excrement department. And, the, and so it, the whole entourage of Henry VIII or of Elizabeth and so on would stay in one castle for a while. And then it would just become so disgusting right. that they would have to move to another castle while the first castle was being all cleaned up. 